I do want to invite you now to open a Bible to Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, That's where we're at together today as we continue on during this Christmas season, looking at different passages in Isaiah uh, as they paint for us this portrait of Jesus' first coming and they uh, help us anticipate his second coming. Uh, And we're looking at how worthy he is of our lives this month uh, during this Christmas season. Uh, I think around this time of the year, no matter where you go, Uh, you cannot escape the messaging that you see almost everywhere, the messaging that says peace on earth, peace on earth. No matter if you're in a um, kind of Christian community event, you're going to see that, hopefully. But you might even go to a non-Christian event and you will hear and even see displayed those words, peace on earth. Everybody seemingly wants peace this time of the year. We're reminded of our longing for peace this time of the year, whether you are a Christian or not a Christian. But I, I wonder if someone were to press you and ask you, what do you mean by peace? What is that? How would you describe it? I think peace is something that can just roll off the tongue. It's something that we assume that we each understand and want. But if someone were to ask you, well, what does that mean? If you were to have peace, what would that look like in your life? I'm curious what you would kind of fumble around to describe. I think for most of us, we would um, probably think about either the uh, presence of things in our life. You know, we we would think of um, things like, well, it would look like peace is me experiencing my mom or my dad being with me again. Uh, Maybe uh, your kids have uh, grown up and they've moved away, and so you would say something like, peace would be all of my children being in my house for Christmas, all under one roof, that would be peace. Or peace, uh, maybe during a time of financial difficulty, would look like uh, more money in your bank account. That would make you feel at peace, maybe. Or maybe you would describe the absence of things. You would say something like, uh, peace would look like uh, this conflict in my friendship finally being done away with, the conflict being gone. You know, maybe you would think of the absence of some stressful thing at your work. You're like, if that was just resolved, then I would finally be at peace. Or maybe peace would look like the absence of your kids screaming at the top of their lungs during that hyper hour right before dinner. You know what I'm talking about? That hour right before dinner where you're like, man, why is it every day at this time? You go crazy, you know? Or maybe you think naturally of like the absence of war. You know, you would love to tune into the news one day and they're like, we have nothing to report. Everything's great. You know, nothing's even going on in the world. When we hear that phrase, peace on earth, what do we really mean? And I think if you could even like kind of begin to get your hands around it a little bit, it would still feel like wishful thinking, wouldn't it? There would still be a sense that if I had that, you know, let's just say all the kids are under the same roof for Christmas, you know that they're going to leave your house again. So the, the, the idea of peace being something not only we would understand and have, but that we could hold on to forever feels like wishful thinking. It's fleeting, isn't it? Well, if you've ever wondered these sorts of things, then you, I'm telling you, you're on the brink of discovering the true beauty and wonder of Christmas. You're on the brink of discovering that. Because we don't just walk around and see peace on earth thinking, wouldn't it be nice, but it'll never happen. No, what we see in our passage this morning in Isaiah chapter 9, which is a very famous passage associated with Christmas, we see this, that real lasting peace that you lack is only found in letting Jesus rule you. It's only found when you not only can see and believe in Jesus, but you surrender your life to him and let him begin to rule you. That's where peace comes. I want us to look verse at two through five first, and then we'll continue on in verses six through seven. And when we get to verses six through seven, that's when you'll, you know, the memory will, will strike up. You'll go, I've heard this before. But let's start with verses two through five of this great poem that we see here, this prophecy of Isaiah in chapter nine, beginning in verse two. It reads, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You've multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. 
They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What Isaiah wants us to see in these first few verses, verses two through five, is this incredible promise of peace. God is promising you peace. That's what's happening here. Look in verse two again. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. I think the interesting thing about Christmas lights is that you can't really appreciate them until it's dark out, right? Uh, we, went and looked, we walked around parts of Redlands as a family on Friday night looking at Christmas lights with our hot chocolate, you know, pretending we're in like a Hallmark movie or something. And, uh, but we didn't go out at 2 p.m., you know? I mean, if you go around town and you see it's like the middle of the day and someone's Christmas lights are on, you're just like, they're wasting energy. Right? You can't appreciate the lights until it's dark. In the same way, if you go downtown to State Street or, you know, over to the plaza today for lunch and you saw somebody walking around with a flashlight, you would think something's wrong with them. Because you don't need those kinds of things until it's dark outside. You can't appreciate the value of a flashlight. You can't appreciate the beauty of the Christmas lights until it's dark. And in the same way, you can only begin to truly appreciate what Isaiah is saying here. You only can truly begin to wonder at what Christmas is saying to you amidst the backdrop of the darkness that it's set in. Because we looked at this last week, but this chapter, Isaiah chapter 9, it's written in a period of time about... 800 years before the birth of Jesus, during a time when the nation of Israel is split into two kingdoms. You have the nation of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. You have Jerusalem, which is the capital of Judah. You have Samaria, which is the capital of Israel. And as we talked about last week, Israel is now in an alliance, so to speak, with Syria, and they've decided we're gonna go down to Judah and we're gonna take out King Ahaz, we're gonna conquer Judah and set up a king that will do what we tell him to do. And so there's a lot of fear going on right now. There are dark clouds, you could say, of war, of sin, of relational and national conflict just rolling over the horizon during this period of time. And so Ahaz, what he decides to do in the midst of this, we talked about this last week, is that he, instead of trusting in God, which is what God asked him to do, he began to trust in the kingdom of Assyria instead, which was threatening to come in and take over that part of the world. He thinks Assyria is going to give him the peace that he's looking for. He unleashes Syria on these nations of Israel and Syria, but then what Assyria does is it turns around and they unleash their power over him. And the place that now Judah has found itself is in a time of deep darkness, a time of horrible suffering and destituteness. Because just look up in chapter 8. What does it say in chapter 8, verse 21, just for a little bit of this backdrop? It says this, now that Assyria has come through and has uh, you know, really conquered Judah, it says they will pass through the land, Judah will, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they'll be thrust into deep darkness. See, over and over again, God has said, listen to me, trust me, follow me. But Ahaz and his people have said, no, we're gonna do things our own way. 
We're going to trust in something that looks powerful to us, that feels like it matters, but it didn't provide the peace they thought they would get. That's what it's saying to us here. Instead, everywhere they look, they just see darkness, gloom, anguish. But what is the darkness? It's not like there's an eclipse over the land for years or something like that. It's not a physical darkness. What is the darkness that that Isaiah is describing for them? It's the real darkness is them being separated from God, them being in the dark and not uh, enjoying his blessing, his life, his light, right? That's, That's the real darkness that they're experiencing, and that's the real darkness that you and I should be worrying about. The greatest darkness in this world is not just the brokenness that we have and the real pain that we experience, whether in our own relationships with other people, whether in those estranged relationships, conflict. It's not just in the emotional pain or the physical pain or the financial uh, pain that you endure in this world. Those are all just symptoms of the actual darkness that's going on in our lives. See, the the problem of our sinfulness is what consistently, uh, when we live these lives that consistently don't trust in God, but they, they trust in other things. That's what brings about this darkness in our lives at some point. And some of you, Some of you are probably going through that darkness right now. But the world feels dark to you. You wake up and it's not as light as it once seemed. This is the problem that we're all guilty of. We all have looked at how things work and we've looked at God and at some point we said, God, I don't really think you know how this is supposed to go. I I don't really trust you here. I really think this other thing over here is gonna give me what I'm looking for. You just don't understand. God. And in little ways and in big ways, we've all done that. And what does that do? It creates a lack of peace, a darkness in your life. But then we have this shocking and stunning promise of light that's going to break in here in verse 3. Because what happens? They experience this light, this great light in in verse 2. And then in verse 3, what does it say? This experience of this light is like what? You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. Isaiah is saying there is a kind of joy that comes when the light dawns. And what does that joy feel like? It feels like having a lot of food. That's what Isaiah says, isn't it? All right? There's a joy that comes when, it, when this pierces the darkness. It's described as this crop that there would be lots of fear in a culture like theirs, an agrarian society where if you came to a fall and then the crop wasn't as big, the harvest wasn't as full as they were hoping it would be, that would mean it's going to be a tough year. Right? They didn't have like uh, markets that you can go to and have food imported from all around the world or something like that. And so they would, they would experience just this extreme amount of fear, of, of lack, of this sort of thing. But then when you have that kind of harvest, there's a joy that comes. When the war is over is another image here, and they're divvying up what the resources of their enemy, and now they have more of the things that they didn't have before because they've conquered their enemies and now they have their things. So what you see here in verse three is this movement. It's from fear to joy. It's from fear to joy, but that joy is based on what? It's light being turned on. I don't know if you've ever gone through like um, a rough night, a rough winter or something, and the power went out. Is there, does that happen here? I don't know, but where I, I mean, I was raised in Montana and Oregon and places like, lived in those places, and like every winter there'd be some time where the power just goes out, and you're, it's like seven o'clock, and you're like, I need to go to bed. Is this like the pioneer life or something? You know, like there's nothing to do, and so maybe I remember one night vividly we set up the candles and you know, we, um, we sat by our gas fireplace because apparently that worked during that time and, and we're trying to make the most of it. But if you've ever gone without power for a while, right, it's, it's, it's pretty rough, you know, for our uh, affluent society to go through something like that. But have you ever experienced that feeling when the power finally came on? Right, what happens? Your heart does like a little cartwheel, doesn't it? Right, you're just like, oh my gosh, like everything's great again, you know? And that's exactly what he's describing here. These people have walked in deep darkness, but a light has dawned, and with that comes joy. Their hearts are just doing cartwheels. Why? What's actually happened? What's actually happened? Well, there's these three fours. You see one in verse four, verse five, and verse six. 
And these three fours are describing something that's actually happened. What does Isaiah mean when he says light has dawned in this world? He's describing it here for them. Verse four says the first reason of what this light really looks like is, is, is that they're going to be free that their freedom is what he's referring to when this light comes in. Because what does it say? The yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. It's the slavery is going to be broken. And just like God showed up with Gideon and defeated the Midianites, he's going to do that again, but in a much more profound way. He's going to show up and, and, and free his people from their greatest oppression. This, this wasn't like slavery in Egypt where they weren't living in their own land. This is a, an oppression they're experiencing because they're living in their own land, but they're being conquered by somebody else. And so Assyria is constantly living as this threat over them in a war zone. They're living in a war zone. And they're always feeling oppressed. They're always looking over their shoulder. And he's saying, you're going to be free. You're going to be free. I'm promising you that. This is the kind of freedom God brings when the light finally dawns. I've I've once uh, heard a story of a man who grew up as a missionary kid in El Salvador, and he described his experience living in that country of just incredible violence to where at night they couldn't sit in view of the window. They'd have to like lay on the floor or in a room that didn't have windows for fear that someone would just shoot through the windows and, and kill them. And so they had to like lay on the floor and just complete terror all the time, okay? That's, that's like oppression. I mean, that's like you're, you're living in a war zone kind of feeling. What Isaiah is describing here, if you were to take that exact example of this person's life, he's saying what's going to happen to you is like you're going to sit in your recliner at 10 o'clock at night with the blinds fully open and the lights fully on and you're going to just be at peace eating your favorite snack or something. He's like, that's the kind of liberation picture that you're supposed to see here. But, but then we have the second reason in verse five. What is the second reason? The battle is actually over. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. If you think about it, this is a pretty graphic picture, isn't it? I mean, what an image. Look at the details. There's garments rolled in blood, okay? Uh, what does this have to do with Christmas? Is this like diehard kind of Christmas movie type stuff here? Well, no, he, like think about war movies. Have you ever seen like a war movie? And at some point, maybe depending on the war movie, it'll pan over a battlefield that was just fought on and there'll be just tons of people lying there deceased. And if you're weird like me, every single time I think, man, someone's got to clean that up. Like, what do you do with that? You don't just leave all those people there. Maybe, maybe you're, I don't know, maybe I'm a clean freak or something. I don't know, and I think about these kinds of things. But, but someone's got to do something with all that carnage. And that's the imagery here. There's people here cleaning stuff up. They're building a bonfire because the battle is over. Right? It's, it's graphic, but it's meant to be liberating. This is quite a picture. In fact, there, there's really a sense of finality here. And we know this because of, look at what's being burned here. It's the boots. Right? You, if there was garments that are stained with blood, you, you could throw those things away. We can burn those things, right? Because we're not going to wear those again. But boots, good boots. I mean, we might need those again for the next war. We can clean those kind of things up and use those things again. But you would only burn boots if they aren't going to be used again. If there's not going to be another war. Do you, do you see what's happening here? In other words, there is no more war that's ever going to happen again when this light dawns. These verses here are powerful. Verses 2 through 5 are promising you peace. But do you notice how it's written? It's written in the past tense, isn't it? It's talking about something in the form of a promise, but it's talking about it like it's it's already happened. Isn't this incredible? It's that done of a deal. I mean, just this weekend... um, my kids were surprised by their um, cousins visiting us uh, from Oregon. It was uh, jubilation. The lights dawned in the darkness kind of a moment for them. And uh, it's been a lot of fun having um, uh, my wife's sister here. And when, when people visit, we always want to sit down with them and be like, what do you guys want to do? Right? I mean, there's so many things we could do here. 
in Southern California. And so, you know, we decided that we were going to go to Hollywood. We were going to see Hollywood. And, um, you know, we went up to the, um, oh my gosh, what is that? Uh, Griffith Observatory. That's what we went and saw that yesterday. It was amazing, beautiful day. So we laid out, we're going to go to the Griffith Observatory. We're going to see the Hollywood sign. Apparently it's the 100th year and go down to the stars and all that kind of stuff. And you go down once, you're like, all right, we're not doing that again for a while. But, um, you know, you like, go and see these things. So let's just say, right, that we sit down with them on Friday and we're laying all the plans. And I sit there and I go, all right, guys, you've seen the Griffith Observatory. You've eaten in and out Burger. You've, eat, you've drank Blue Bottle Coffee. You stood on your, your favorite Hollywood star, right? They're going to go, what is wrong with you? Right? Like, I haven't seen any of those. We haven't experienced any of those things yet. But if I talk about those things as if they've already done it, they would think something's wrong with me, like I'm chemically imbalanced or something. I don't know, that I don't understand promises, I guess. But what I would be doing is saying, we are so going to do this that you can just take it to the bank. We can talk like it's already done. That, that's, what it's, that's what this language is doing here. God is promising you peace but in the past tense, it's going to be the reality, you guys. How? How is this going to be the reality? Well, it's not going to come from within you. That's never worked, has it? It's not going to come from this world. It's not like we're going to come to a place where we're like, you know what, if we can just get the right politicians in place, you know, if we could just do this new thing with our society or something, then we'll finally achieve peace on earth. I'll finally have that peace in my soul, and it won't leave me ever again. Right? We know that this light that we're talking about, it's not, it can't come from this world. It's impossible. It's never worked, and it's still not working as we keep trying to find it in this world. So how is this peace promised to us in that sort of profound way? Well, we find where unending peace is found in verses 6 through 7 in this third four. This is where unending peace is found. It's in this child who is born, this son who is given, and he has a government that is on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David, he's coming from the line of David, so this is a, a king that will sit in Jerusalem on that throne and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. And how is he going to rule with justice and with righteousness from this time forth, right now and forevermore? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. When you think of the, the battle finally being over and our solution to our peace problem showing up, this is not exactly what you might picture. I know you're familiar with it probably, but if you think back, this is not what you would imagine. I mean, we essentially have a, like a gender reveal party here, right? This, is, this doesn't feel like it's going to give us the strength that we're looking for. I mean, we might picture a promise of some ripped young king showing up with a double-edged sword you know, that sort of thing, taking care of business, casting out the darkness, but no, we have a baby. God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us is a child. A child that's going to sit on David's throne, and he's going to do for God's people what every other king and human being has failed to do and that is to bring lasting peace. Not peace simply with surrounding nations, but peace between you and God. He's a child who comes into this world in the most human of ways, a birth, but is described in ways that surpass anybody in human history. Because notice, he's not just born, what is he? He's given. He's given. Unto you a son is given, have you ever met any other person in this world that's been given to the world? Sure, maybe you met a guy who thought he was God's gift to women or something like that, right? But have you ever met a person who really thought they were given to the world? 
We, we see in places like Luke chapter 2, John three sixteen, countless other places that this child that's going to be given is none other than Jesus himself. So this, this passage is not debated in any Christian circle. This is the climactic Old Testament promise about the coming of Jesus Christ. But what's important to see is that he has other names. And names mean something here. Right? They mean something here. He has four names to be exact. The second one I think is the most striking on the face of it, because what is his name? Mighty God. Mighty God. I mean, some people have actually tried to water this down and say this literally just means something like a God-like hero. But if someone ever says that to you, all you have to do is point them to chapter 10, verse 21, this is the next chapter over, that says a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And everyone say, well, that means God there. Well, it's the same exact phrase here. He is mighty God. That's his name. He's divine. He is incarnate deity. He's not just a holy man. Jesus is not just the most interesting man to ever come into this world. He is God, like real God, like 100%. And if that's hard to believe, I get it. But this is what it means to be a Christian. I mean, I'll one of my favorite stories is uh, when Jesus resur- is resurrected from the dead and he appears to all his disciples except for Thomas. And Thomas says, I will never believe until I can see him with my eyes and put my hands in his scars. And so Jesus in kindness shows up, appears to doubting Thomas, and he says, place your fingers here. But what does Thomas say in response to that? My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. That's the earliest Christian confession, is to look at Jesus and say, you're not just another person, you are mighty God, right? That's stunning enough, but look more carefully, he's also called what? Wonderful counselor. He's, he's, got, he's full of wisdom. He's the supernatural teacher, is what that literally means. He guides you. You, you can ask him, you can talk to him, he will counsel you as you follow him. He keeps going, he's gonna be called Everlasting Father. A father, of course, is someone who cares for and protects his family, at least that's what fathers are supposed to do. Here, Jesus is gonna have not just a biological family, but a worldwide family because of the scope of his influence. Do you see it? It's just gonna keep increasing, it's gonna keep growing over and over again. Right, so, so if you know him, he has intimate knowledge of you. You will never be out of his sight. He knows exactly what you need and when you need it. This is why the Bible would say he knows the amount of hairs on your head. There's not a bird that falls to the ground that he doesn't notice it. He's everlasting father. And then we have this third title, which is the one that's most emphasized in our passage. It's the one most emphasized at Christmas. It's our Advent candle this morning. He's the Prince of Peace. And yes, that means he's bringing peace today, because what does it say? From this time forth and forevermore. But there's still gonna be wars. Jesus told us about those wars that will come. But he's here to bring you peace today. That's why he's here, is to offer you peace. That's why when he walked around, he kept saying, peace be to you. As we read today, my peace I give to you. What's he talking about? We learn very clearly what he's talking about if you read places like Ephesians 2. Let's say, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off walking in darkness have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus has come to bring peace, but not just something that you put in your pocket kind of peace, not just to get you through the moment kind of peace, not even just an absence of war kind of peace. Peace between you and God. For all of us who have ever said, I I don't trust God, right? He doesn't really get me. I don't think he really gets this world, right? He doesn't, his ideas are outdated, you know? Like he needs to kind of modernize his views. I'm gonna live my own way. 
For every one of us that have ever said that and turned our back on him and gone our own way and trusted after other things, it's those of us that are now left stumbling around in the darkness. But the light is dawned. So what's life like when you finally stop trying to do things your own way and you actually start living under the rule of Jesus? Well, the experience of that rule we see in verse seven is that his government will increase and have no end. So think about what that means for you. Basically, one day, there will be no other kingdom except his kingdom. So, if you are not a joyful citizen of that kingdom now, that's not good news for you. His kingdom is going to keep growing and increasing and expanding. But if you joyfully receive him as king today, look at what this unending kingdom brings. What? Unending increase of peace. How does that work? I don't really know. It just says it, right? We'll all figure it out together someday, but it says peace will somehow just keep increasing, right? There will be never an end to this peace. He doesn't have good days and bad days. He doesn't at one point make a good decision and the next moment go, sorry, I was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. God doesn't rule that way. His ways are always righteous and just from now until forever. His days of ruling will have no end and therefore his peace will have no end. That this word peace means when all things are as they should be. Everything is the way that it should be. That's what you're longing for, right? All things are the way they should be. See, most of the time in our history, especially the history of Israel, there would be a king and he'd be a good king. And as he ruled in goodness, there'd be peace. The problem is he would die. And every time he would die, another king would come along and eventually that next king would maybe be a bad king and they wouldn't experience peace. The Old Testament is basically that story over and over again, right? Even Hezekiah, who most people thought this was referring to, he dies at the end of chapter 39 in Isaiah, and he is um, Jesus' great, great, great grandfather, like 15 times over, and he says something interesting. He says that at least there will be peace in my days. There was peace when Hezekiah was king. Problem is he died, right? And he never ruled again. So the constant refrain throughout the ages until Jesus comes was simply, who can be good enough and who can reign long enough that we could experience peace forever? And that's what Christmas carries with it, this incredible promise that the only way that you can have no end to someone's rule is if they are God himself. And that's exactly what Christmas is telling you. That this child's coming promises that as Prince of Peace, he's going to bring full shalom. He's going to make things exactly the way that they are supposed to be. And he is promising you now that if you know him, your best days are always ahead of you and never behind you. How can you be sure? Well, it ends with this incredible line, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I actually love this line because prophecy is basically saying, hey, God's going to do this thing. But Isaiah is saying, hey, God's going to do this thing, and hey, God's really going to do this thing. The Lord of hosts is going to do this. His zeal is going to do this. The, the word zeal means to become intensely red. It's like when you almost embarrassingly show too much emotion and all the blood just rushes to your face. That's zeal. That's zeal. My zeal tends to bulldoze people. It tends to be too passive. I don't know about you. What does God's zeal do? Well, it, it drove him. It drove him somewhere specifically, it drove him to the cross. And Jesus was that king that came as the light into the darkness, and he took credit for all the wrongs that you did and gave you credit for all the good things he did. And he comes to make peace between you and God, not by signing a peace treaty, but by shedding his own blood, by making peace between you and God. He is the ruler who climbed onto a cross and literally endured your deepest darkness, so much so that Mark's gospel points out that when he was hanging on the cross and noon hit, the day when it should be the brightest, darkness fell over the land until 3 p.m. What was happening there? 
Well, he comments, Jesus says in that moment, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, we were thrust into the deep darkness because of our sin. Maybe you felt that forsakenness and that darkness, and if you have, we've deserved that. But Jesus went through that darkness. He experienced that greatest lack of peace so that God's light of peace would shine in your heart today. And so as you sail through the storms in this life, your soul could be anchored to him, that you could experience peace even in the midst of chaos. This is, this is the wonder of Christmas. I'm telling you, it's not wishful thinking. It's not just this nice idea, but hey, this world is just too crazy. No, peace is promised, but that peace that's promised is only found in, in, in you letting Jesus rule your life and you seeing him as the king. Do you have that? Do you have that in your life? You can. I mean, maybe you're here and you're like, well, I would like peace, but I would like that without Jesus ruling me. Right? We, we can tend to want the gift without the giver. I mean, yes, we want peace. We want to be given it as that gift that we can unwrap and utilize whenever we want. But that peace is not found in a, as a thing. It's only found in the person who's offering it to you. It's found in the person whose life has it, who's achieved the peace for you. It's not a pill you put in your pocket that you just take out when you feel like you need to be de-stressed in some way. No, this is, this is letting God come and deal with your sin and cast out the darkness and then live in you and rule over you. I mean, you might be sitting here going, I don't want anybody to rule me, but how's that going out for you? You know, like if you're ruling your own life and guiding your own self, if you're your own wonderful counselor, if you're your own mighty God and you're your own father and your own prince of peace, like how's that really going for you? I doubt it's going very well. Many times I've told people this and I found it liberating myself, but when we were going through this process of trying to process if God was moving us here to California from where we were ministering in Oregon, you just go through those seasons of life where you're feeling a lack of peace maybe or you're kind of dis disoriented, you're trying to discern what God's really doing. But there's a liberating thing that happens when you come to a place in your life where you just look at God and you simply say this, you simply say, Jesus, tell me what to do and I will obey you. Tell me what to do and I will obey you. It doesn't solve everything, but at least put your heart in the right place to where you're going, I just want your will. Whatever that is, I want that. I know that with you is peace. That's the invitation. And maybe you're here and your struggle is different. Maybe you just depersonalize this story. And if that's you, this will do nothing for your life. You read this and you go, yeah, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, but you're really just thinking unto them a son is given. Unto them a child is born. Spurgeon said a Christian should say, unto me this son is given. A Christian is someone who says, unto me this child is born. He says, for indeed, if Christ is not my Christ, he is of little worth to me. If I cannot say he loved me and gave himself for me, of what impact is all the merit of his righteousness or the fullness of his atonement? And he gives this picture. He says, bread in the shop is well enough. But if I'm hungry and I cannot give it, get it, I starve even though the pantries are full. Water in the river is well enough, but if I'm in a desert and I cannot reach the stream, even if I can hear it, I'm gonna die of thirst. In the same way, you guys, peace comes when you can finally say by faith, unto me this son is given. Unto me a son is given. Not for me to hold, but for him to hold me. Not for me to boss around, but for him to rule me. And when you can say that, you'll finally have peace. 
Heavenly Father, this morning, as we think about what your son has done in coming and dying and living for us now, God, I pray that the places where we lack peace today, that you would bring into a crystal clear view how that's really just pointing us to the peace that we tend to forget about and that we tend to lack in our relationship with you. And so, Father, I do pray and ask that today, as we sing about this peace, as we sing about you coming, as we hear about the peace you provide, that it would strike each one of us personally in a way that lasts, in a way that lives in us, Lord. So help us to see that that is really talking about you, God, that you are that peace that we lack, that we now have in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.